Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Women in Sport webinar. My name is Deirdre Lavin, and I'm the Sports Coordinator with Sligo Sport and Recreation Partnership. And together with our team of six officers and under the directorship of our board, we work to have more people more active more often throughout County Sligo. And we do this by working with you, the clubs and the community organisations and our partners to deliver and facilitate programmes and to also build capacity among clubs. And we do it for all ages and all ability levels. And among the many groups, we have various target groups we particularly focus on. And among those are women and girls. And to date, and indeed for over the last 15 years, we've worked very closely on the whole area of participation for women and girls in sport. And thankfully, with the help of clubs, we've made progress. And a key milestone was actually achieved in 2015 when the Irish Sports Monitor for data collated for Sligo and Mayo indicated that we actually had eliminated the gradient between men and women's participation. And this very much coincides with the national picture because in 2019, the gradient in women and men's sport uh, variance is down to 3%. So what we can conclude from that is the direction of participation is very favorable and going in the right direction. And I suppose now it is timely that we actually shine the light on the whole area of leadership. And that's what tonight is all about. And from our webinar tonight, I suppose we want to achieve three things. Firstly, we want to share with you the findings we have got from our own women's uh, leadership survey with the sports clubs. Secondly, we want to actually start the conversation about getting more women involved in leadership. And I cannot think of a better opportunity than here tonight because we have a wonderful guest list of speakers. And finally, we want to introduce our Women in Leadership course, which is one of our first efforts to support this whole area of leadership. So now I think I am going to hand over to our MC. But before I do so, I'd like to just say a few words and introduce Lisa Clancy, who is our MC. And I also would like to acknowledge Sarah O'Shea, who with Lisa have been absolute pioneers and real advocates for women in sport. And both Lisa and Sarah are with us tonight. And some of their main achievements in this whole area is that they were lead consultants on the national sports policy developed by the Sport Ireland. And they're also are the leaders in terms of facilitating our new leadership course, which they've done very successfully to date at national level. So all that remains for me to say is, I hope you enjoy the webinar. And I think Sligo can become a leader in the whole area of women in leadership and sport. And I encourage all of you to join with us uh, on that journey as we go forward. And I now am delighted to hand over to our MC for the night, Lisa Clancy. And thank you very much, Deirdre. Have we got sound? I hope you can all hear me. And a very Kate Nita Fall chat to you all. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here this evening. I am thrilled to be talking to people in Sligo, but I would prefer to be in Sligo. I think when the pandemic hit and we first chance I got that we could travel, I was twice down to Strand Hill. So it is the second best thing that I can be talking to you online about a subject that I'm very passionate about, female sports leadership. Uh, I, I work in the area with a number of sports. I have worked um, in the GAA for a number of years. And tonight we're gonna to talk about uh, women leadership sport, which I've developed with my colleague, Sarah O'Shea, who's gonna fill you in about a bit about it. But look, this is about you. Um, I was thrilled to see about 90, nearly 100 people registered tonight. We have males and females. We have coaches, teachers, lecturers from the Sligo IT, kayaking, cycling, motor rowing, yachting. We have so many sports here tonight. And that's what we want, a good conversation. Let's start the conversation. But I had to, when I was looking at the list, have to call out one group because I think um, showing the way definitely in leadership terms for women, uh, the Maeve Dragon Warriors, because you know they're a new club that I've heard about set up on Sunday and everybody is, uh, you know, uh, has had breast cancer. And I just think this is the kind of leadership amongst women that we need. So looking forward to hearing from you all, because tonight is a bit of a two-way thing. 
we want you to engage with us. We want you to go on social media. The hashtag is Lead Hers Sligo. So if you want to tweet out any key messages, um, feel free to do so and make sure you include Sligo Sports Recreation Partnership in that. And also get in the questions there. We will have the panel. Everybody come back to us at the end. So put in your questions and we will uh, answer them for you along the way. So um, Deirdre, um, a sports coordinator, and they do lead, they, they do walk the walk, in my view, in terms of um, sports partnerships around the country. This is an all-female team tonight. Um, we've got uh, Teresa Kilgannon is our, our technical expert for the night as part of the team. And Diane Middleton, who actually originally did the course with myself and Sarah at national level a few months ago, is my eyes and ears tonight. So she's with us. So that is great. But why I say Sligo walk the walk is like, we have a female in charge in Sligo. Deirdre, um, previously, she's been with uh, Sligo, I think since 2001. She was before that a PE teacher. And she's actually in a position where she can make changes. She sits in the National Sports Leadership Group um, chaired by the Minister for Sport. And that has the remit of overseeing the implementation of national sports policy. So in their own county, we have a lot of leaders already. And I was delighted that uh, to find out as I was talking to the to the guys here in Sligo that the chair, Emer Kilcannon, who's going to finish off this evening, is also a female. So we've got a lot of female leaders here, which is fantastic, but it's how to push this on. And um, I'm delighted the first person I'm going to introduce um, to ask to step up to speak is Shuan Crown. She took up the role here uh, as sports development officer, specifically looking at the women in sport area. Um, she's a coach, the under 16s, the Irish basketball team, but also Shuan came on our course as well uh, with Diane um, on the women leadership course at a national level. And she started off by doing what we should all should do, trying to find out well, what's the situation at the moment in Sligo, um, because it's only from there that we can learn and step forward. So Shuan, I'm going to ask you now to bring us through your findings so we can all have a here listen. Thank you so much, Lisa. Let me just, here we go. So as Lisa said, one of the main things, and one of the important things for us was to gather a view and a vision of what's actually going on in Sligo. What's the landscape of sport here? What are we actually working with? And to figure that out, we sent a survey out to all of our clubs in August, 2021. So only a few months ago and asked them a variety of questions. So. 64 clubs came back to us. So that is over 50% of our club database. And to us, that's quite considerable. That should give us a very good vision of what's going on in Sligo. As well as that, we had 31 sports represented. And for such a small county, to me, that seems like such a considerable number. And this number and the sports represented was really important to us because we wanted to gather the experience and the knowledge and the information from both the minority and majority sports, because they're both, both equally important to us. They both have different experiences of this. So I'll give you a really brief rundown of some of the information and the statistics that we found. And one of the first things that we found that in 2021, there are only nine percent of chair people in Sligo that are female, while the other 91 percent are male. And even that graphic shows you exactly what what it's looking like here in Sligo. And we asked the question, is this consistent or is this an anomaly or has this been evident throughout the past few years? And we asked our clubs, in the previous 10 years, have you ever had a female chairperson? And only 28% of our clubs have had that. And you may think 28% in 10 years, that's a really low number. And we could argue that it probably is, it is, yes, but that gives us so much scope to improve and progress. One of the really interesting findings was that 56% of our clubs recognize and acknowledge that they have women and girls in their club holding unofficial positions of leadership. 
And these unofficial positions of leadership are very wide and ranging and can come in very different ways and manners. So it could be partners or relations of sitting committee members or coaches. They could be previous committee members who are no longer involved or sitting. They could even be players themselves and they are consulted in deci decision making. And 56% is quite considerable. And also in this number of clubs, they also acknowledge that there is more than one woman or girl holding such an unofficial position of leadership. So we maybe have over 100 women holding unofficial positions of leadership. And we see this as an opportunity to grow, as an opportunity to progress, that we are here to help support these clubs and these women to gain and pursue positions of leadership, whatever they see that as and wherever they may want, may want to continue on to. A really positive statistic for us is that 22% of our clubs have female dedicated roles. So they have created a role within their club or committee that is specifically focusing on female participation, maybe a women in sport lead or women's officer. They are actively trying to improve women in sport within their club and in, within their sport. Our clubs are also saying that they are involving females in their executive. And it's something that they're really proactive in. We can see this in this 22%. They're also really actively trying to develop the women's side. So it's on the same level and as strong as the men's side. Our clubs are also acknowledging that it does take time. It's not going to happen overnight, but all this hard work and commitment that they are putting into progressing women in sport, they're really seeing the good progress of it. And we want to be able to further support them in this. I'll leave you here with the infograph that we created of all the information that we gathered. We'll be releasing this after the webinar so that you can take the time to go through it because there is a lot of information that we gathered, so it can be a bit overwhelming, but I'll be sure to send it out to you all so that you can have a good look at it and see what women in sport is like here in Sligo. Great, um, thank you so much, Shun. Uh, before you, we move on, and I know you'll be coming back for the panel, but just one question then, where do you see the, the main opportunity for Sligo in this area? I think there's scope all across the board, to be honest. And I think for Sligo, we know there are so many clubs and we've so many ambassadors here who are willing to make a difference and who are actively trying to make a difference. Mm. Um, I think it's going to be targeting that unofficial positions of leadership, personally. I think that was what stood out most for me, that they're already in the roles. How do we make it a bit more official, a bit more secure for them, offer them a bit more support? And if they are in position, official positions, we can help them and so that can their clubs. Great, okay. Thank you so much for that. I think it's really good that we have the information we'd start to, to step up to. And um, that I think that's really interesting statistics that we can come back maybe and, and measure in a couple of years time. So thank you so much, Shun. Next, I'm gonna um, call up Damien McCallion. Um, Damien lives in Strand Hill and he has a connection with the previous speaker in that he set up Soccer Sisters and Shun was actually a member of the, that Soccer Sisters uh, group. So uh, when she was much younger, she tells me, um, firstly, and he's also got a connection with me because we used to work together many years ago, back in 2006 or seven, when I was in the HSC. So you never know, networking is important. You never know where somebody would pop up. Um, but really, we're here to talk about his role uh, as a father, as a whose daughter's involved with sport, as a, a husband whose wife's involved with sport, whose sister's involved with sport. And uh, Damien has set up, uh, he's also the vice chair of Strand Celtic, and he's been a coach. Um, male champions are so critical in this area. I, I'd never have the opportunities in my life without males to back me on my sporting journey. So it's important to have that voice today. Um, and Damien, I'm just going to start off with straight off the bat, any reaction to the results that uh, Shewan has just actually told us? Well, the numbers are very low in terms of the formal roles. That, that's a bit scary in one way, you know, that, that figure. It's, it's, um, it can be challenging to fill roles in clubs at the best of times, but to see that figure, I think it's a huge disparity. 
Uh, obviously, it's interesting then to see the unofficial roles. Uh, and if you take out, you know, there are some sports then where by their nature, there's perhaps a greater number of women involved. So, you know, when you've adjusted from that basis, I suspect across a whole wide range of sports, it's a really low figure. Um, I suppose our experience in our own club has been over the years, we've been lucky. We've had some brilliant female role models, people who know people like Fanola Monaghan, Nashleen Curran, Rosie Morrissey, people who've been involved for years and years. Uh, they've taken a number of cycles through their own kids through in some cases and gone back to the start again and gone right up in terms of serving on committees. Uh, Fanola has moved on to the local Saga Leitrim Youth League and is the secretary of that league. So at local sort of a governing body type level. Um, but I think one of the challenges is if you get people like that and, and uh, who are that sort of evangelical and really put their time into it over very long periods, you need to make sure you have a base of people coming behind them. So when they step away, that you have other people that can easily float into those roles and, uh, in, and in a wider sense as well. So I think that's one of the things we've learned is that in some ways then you have a very good representation of women. We had that at committee level, a coaching level. Then a number of those people through the natural cycle either move on uh, to other roles. Uh, and then if you don't have a wide base of women involved, then you end up you know, uh, caught in that sort of logjam. So the numbers I think are worrying in terms of the total numbers that are there. But obviously as Shewan has flagged then underneath that, there's clearly a whole pool of people um, that hopefully we need to try and do more in clubs to, to encourage through. Uh, we just had our own committee meeting last night and we discussed it because this, this event was on this evening and the course is on next week. And it was interesting just some of the take, you know, when people register now, it's all done online. You try and encourage them to volunteer and you're going through the list. And one of the guys, the secretary had rung 40 people who'd indicated they'd be prepared to get involved in various things. But of the 40, it was down to five by the end of the 40 calls, you know. So there's a challenge in general. And I think you have to try and broaden out your base of people that are involved and particularly in terms of, of women. And as you say, with the soccer sisters, like even from a, a child safety perspective, it's critical to have women involved, like that's part of the guidance and so on. So um, it's really getting people involved young. I suppose years ago when we started it, what we found was if you got parents in at the start, we used to give a green jacket. And as one person said to me once, the problem when you get that jacket, it costs you 20 years of your life because you never get away again. <laughs> so, but it is about trying to incentivize people and create, I suppose, a, an environment. And I was talking to someone in Dublin the other day who was involved, a woman very involved in one of the GA clubs there. And she said to me that she's a secretary of one of the sections. One of the key things they found was trying to, you know, work with people and say, look, we'll do, if you're uncomfortable from a coaching perspective, we'll run a crash course, same as, as a fellow, but men are probably more stubborn to just throw themselves into it and don't even pretend they know what they're doing. <laughs> um, so I think there is a little bit of that about how do you create an environment where you encourage people to get involved at a very early stage and then they'll develop through and then also maybe identify people who might have an interest beyond that that aren't necessarily involved in the sport, don't have a background in the sport, but might be interested in helping from a sort of general uh, community level. And then that proves invaluable. We set up a development committee in Strand Hill to develop the park. And we've got some fabulous um, young women involved in the last couple of years who've done huge work. We had a big event this year, the Fittest Family. Uh, and that was driven by a small number of subgroup of our, our group like that. So it is about trying to, I suppose, create a, a way where people will get more involved they don't feel they're going to, you know, if they walk into a job, it's going to be thrown over the hill to them. And uh, there you go. That's a general issue, I'd say, for a lot of clubs and committees these days and some of the regulations that are needed. But I think it is a particular challenge for um, to get more women involved and not just in, in the, uh, as I say, things like our soccer sisters or Gaelic football for girls or whatever the sport is uh, in a broader sense as well. You know, it creates a healthier club as well if you have a good mix of people um, from different backgrounds, uh, different genders, different diversity and so on, you know. Yeah, and um, interesting, I was just going to ask you that, I suppose, in, even your experience in your career, you've worked at the ambulance service, and uh, which is kind of more male environment, and then maybe the nursing sector, female environment. And why is it important, do you think, to have a, a mix, uh, particularly in sport? We, we sometimes see, well, we, we feel that sometimes sport is through a very male lens. It is changing. The world is changing. We've made great strides. But why do you think it's important, in your view? Yes, yeah, suppose the health service is interested. A lot of the services actually would be predominantly, you know, if you look at a hospital, it'll, it'll a largely female workforce. If you look at something like the ambulance service that I was involved in, it was largely male. I remember bringing all the managers together for a period uh, for a workshop, and it was, I think it was one female in the room. Uh, and we put in a big campaign, recruitment-wise, we were growing our numbers to try and attract more women into the profession. Uh, and it was very successful, but then that takes time for people to, to move through the organisation. I think in general, you'll get a better culture. Obviously, it's down to individuals as well, not just gender. But I think in general terms, you'll get a better culture with a mix of people. 
um, both in terms of gender and backgrounds and age. So that's important and wider diversity as well. Like we've all got a huge number now of non-national people involved, you know, wider EU, like our chairman's a Portuguese guy at the moment. We have a Polish guy who's sort of involved in some of our coaching committees. So you also have to, to look at trying to make sure you get a, a mix and ultimately you'll end up with a, a better work environment, but particularly a better culture, I suppose, around your club, uh, if you can do that. Uh, and it is, it can, it can be challenging for, for the reasons we were talking about. So I suppose the work experience is definitely some of the best teams you work on have that mix of people, albeit, you know, it's, it is still down to individuals as well to, to make that happen. But certainly in my experience through, through work and through the different environments, you will get a, de a definitely better outcomes uh, and a better culture and a better environment if you have that sort of mix of people and diversity that we talked about both in gender and indeed in other aspects as well, Lisa. Great. And I just one last question then, and we, we'll bring you back to the panel with any questions uh, for everybody. But look, you know, you've you've also been a coach and a male and a dad. And as a dad, is there any, if there are any dads listening tonight, what, what are the things we, we can do to to start now to, to to create future leaders for females in any sport? Yeah, like my, my daughter and wife are very involved in hockey, and I can see a long list of people from the hockey club and the call and Emer can cannon at the end. So I'll be very careful what I say. Um <laughs> I think, look, I suppose for, for one of the things the Sports Recreation and Partnership has been brilliant at is promoting participation. And we've seen it, like I mentioned, our own soccer sisters and underage soccer. Gaelic football for girls has grown. Lots of other sports have, have achieved similar things. So I think that has been a huge success through all of the work of the Sports Recreation and Partnership to get greater participation. And it is about then encouraging, um, I suppose, men as well to get out and support their daughters. We're also lucky we have some... Uh, guys that are very involved in coaching underage girls. Uh, just we've one guy, McMooney, has been through a whole load of the teams and he's background in another cycle. He started even before his own daughters were, were involved. So you do need people like that as well. Um, and again, I think it is about sort of trying to, to support that uh, and encourage that mix of, of, of genders across teams. Um, I think if you get the participation, the key thing for me to get more women involved in different coaching and in, in other roles is to have a good base. If you can get people at the start I, I joked about the jacket, but in one way it is the case. If you can get someone in looking with kids at four, five, six, seven, eight years of age and they enjoy it, hopefully they'll stay with it right through the coaching cycle and then also maybe even help with uh, committees and all of those other things that people sometimes mightn't be as encouraged to get involved in. Great. Um, thank you so much, Damien. Damien's uh, one of the... Uh, one of the healthcare workers getting us all uh, safe during this pandemic. So it's and it's just so great that he's, he's made the time to be with us tonight and we really appreciate it. We'll call you back later uh, when we have the panel and we see some of those questions coming in. Thank you so much, Damien, for that. Thanks. Um, I think um, like Damien from Sligo, we, we, when we started planning this, we were very conscious of, we want to focus on Sligo and the county. And really, um, you know, there is one, person who stands out and we say Sligo and at athletics at the moment and that whole area and you know Mona McSherry uh, at 12 wants to be an Olympian and um, she is over in America uh, studying um, and she went from from Grange to Tokyo I think she's the first Sligo born swim athlete anyway to qualify for the um, selection she's a real role model and um, for for every female in sport um, she's studying away over in America at the moment, but she sent us a message. So I'll say, roll it there, Colette. But <laughs> if anybody is old enough to know what I mean by that, you're ready to go. Hello, everyone. My name is Mona McSharry, and I am pleased to be involved with promoting a great program dedicated to helping more women in leadership roles in clubs and much more. I am a swimmer born and raised in Sligo, currently studying and training at the University of Tennessee in the United States. Hence why I sadly couldn't join you in person today, but I still wanted to give you a couple of notes on why I feel that this is such an important topic. Sport, in my opinion, is amazing. It has shaped my life. I am not defined as just an athlete, but it has helped me become the person I am today. From forming good life skills, my own values, beliefs, and learning about my body, mental health, and how I can best succeed, not only as an athlete, but in life. I have gained friends for life and made connections all over the world with like-minded people. I have the opportunity to compete for my country and now also go to a top level collegiate college in the States. I give my all to sport and it has given me so much in return and has the ability to give something to everyone. I would now consider myself a top level athlete, but the, this learning and forming as a person started from the moment I began swimming. 
This is why sport is so beneficial to any person at any age, no matter what level you want to take it to. I have always encouraged people to get into sport and keep it up through hard times because it can be a great way to disconnect from reality and focus on something else. I use swimming to help me get through the junior cert, the leaving cert, and everyday stresses that we all go through, which for me right now is college. Swimming at, is a time when I don't think about everything that is on my mind because for me during that two hours, nothing else matters. And I think this is a time that everyone in their life would benefit from because let's face it, we all have a lot going on and it can get really stressful. I don't know the exact number, but we can approximate Roughly half of the people in sport all over the world are women. And so to me, it seems only logical that to have equal representation in leadership for roles for, the half of, for that half of the population. Everyone has a different outlook on how something would be done or can be improved, and that includes women. So it is important to be, that we acknowledge that and understand that we as women have just as much to give. I was lucky enough to be coached by a female throughout the majority of my training within my life, but it is important to note that the majority of leadership positions in clubs are male currently. I think it would be amazing if more young women could learn and be inspired by women as I was every day that I walked on deck for training. Thinking back to the different atmospheres that I have experienced within my career, I could talk for hours and compare how I felt some of them may have been better than others based on the people and personalities that surrounded me while I was in those atmospheres. But the key concept to a good training environment, in my opinion, is one where both women and men are included. There is a willingness by all to learn and be corrected, as well as respect for everyone's approaches and ideas. Two of the most important people that come to mind when I think of my career and life thus far have been my mother and my coach, Grace Mead. And yes, they are both women. Both two amazing women who have influenced me greatly, thinking back to some of my earliest competitions where it was just me and my mother, I remember her stepping in as my coach to make me feel more at ease on pool deck. Although she had no qualifications, she gave me little pointers for what she did know from watching training and that's all little 12 year old me needed. Since then, she has been my biggest support in everything I do, learning as I learn, helping in whatever way she can. Grace Mead is a great coach and friend who has taught me a lot in my many years with her. It is important to note that before me, she had never worked with an athlete that was trying to make it to the Olympics, but she was dedicated to my dream and willing to learn and that's all I needed. For both these women, they didn't stand out as my most influential role models because of, for, because of how much knowledge or experience they had or because they were big leaders, but instead it is because they were dedicated to learning and improving to help me learn and improve. We all have to learn somewhere and this course, we, we all have to start somewhere and this course could be the start for many people. I commend the work that Sligo Sport and Recreation Partnership is doing in the area of women in sport at a particip participation level and leadership level. It is so important for women to understand that they have just as much to offer as men and sometimes maybe more. I encourage all of you to nominate people or at least spread the word about the wonderful course and opportunity that has been so successful already. You do not need to be someone that has done outstanding things or be super vocal to be a good leader. You just have to have a love for what you do and a hunger to learn and gain knowledge. Seizing this amazing opportunity and take, and take the seven weeks women in leadership course. Thank you so much for listening to what I had to say on this topic and I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Wow, um, that's uh, what an ambassador. Um, you know, we've got all the ingredients, so it's just to put them together and help more people rise up like Mona. And there's a couple of things that resonated with me anyway about how she had that coach who was dedicated to her dream. And if we've got somebody who believes in us, I, I do believe we can achieve nearly anything if we really, really want something. That was amazing. And how she uses her swing for her mental health. That's fantastic as well. And about, you know, gaining knowledge, we all need to gain knowledge. We don't know everything. And if we put ourselves uh, in a position, put our hands up, uh, as females, we're not great at doing that. Um, uh, we can only improve and make uh, society better. 
So with that, I'm going to call on Kathleen Kane. Step on up, <laughs> Kathleen. Well, Kathleen Kane, I tell you, she ticks, she ticks every single box when I spoke to her. Um, and when Dahi O'Shea uh, was interviewing her, he said, my goodness, I'll be here all night for read out her full bio. And, um, and I can only um, empathize with what he had to say. You know, working in sport, we look at different roles and, and Kathleen has done them all, right? She has been a player, she has managed a team, um, St. Nathie's, she's the, uh, she managed a, a, a team to Croke Park. She has been a referee. She also went into administration at county, provincial level, and she's currently a member of the LGFA uh, Management Committee. And she was actually, we're, we're here now, we'll have to all uh, about to the Hall of Fame award she got in 2020. So, um, and also really why she's here tonight is she's on the board um, of um, Sligo Sports Partnership. And, you know, governance is really important and we can all be involved, but we need, she's huge expertise to, to show the board, because obviously the board shows the way. So Kathleen, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and I'm just going to go straight into this because you've had so many roles, Kathleen. Um, just what's the one piece of advice? Because you've been on a journey and you've, you've seen it through so many different hats um, that you would give to, to any leaders out there or any females out there who, who are looking to be leaders in their own sport. Well, I suppose, Lisa, what I th the first thing I think about is to be passionate about your sport and be brave and don't doubt yourself. If you have an idea, you know, follow through with the idea. When you're involved in your sport, I suppose what I would have found through the years is you surround yourself, and Mona talked about it there, surround yourself with like-minded people. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was just thinking of, of even the panel that we have here from tonight and the internet connections between people. Uh, Mona talked about Grace Mead. Grace Mead actually played Gaelic football for Ballyshannon. And when I was playing with St. Nathie's back in the late 90s, we would play challenge matches against Ballyshannon. So I've actually played against Grace. Damien McCallion's sister, Maura McCallion, played county football with me. And Damien's wife, Brenda, I played <laughs> soccer with her again in the 90s. So, like, you know, it's amazing the connections that people can make. But you look at somebody like Grace Mead, she had a background in Gaelic football. And look at the way she crossed over and the influence that she has had on an Olympian. So, you know, it's, it's all about, you know, as I say, it's, it's, it's being passionate and don't doubt yourself. I mean, 20, back in 1993, myself and my sister and a very good friend, there was no Gaelic football in Sligo. And we just decided, we had heard that there was Gaelic football in Mayo and in a couple of counties. And we said, we'll go to a men's county board meeting. Now, don't ask me how we managed to get invited. But we walk into a cauldron, which was a men's county board meeting. And my friend Bernadette started talking and said about, you know, we wanted to start a Gaelic football in Sligo. And, you know, the, the, the looks that we were getting from the floor, I mean, God above, 27 years ago, 28 years ago, if looks could kill. But, you know, from a very, very small base, that's where the whole thing started. The first county board was set up and then it just it just moved out. Clubs were established, you know, from very, very humble beginnings. It grew to what it is now, you know, and I think about if I were trying to get involved right now, um, you know, to, to me, it seems so much easier. It, it may seem difficult, but it's so much easier because there are so many role models. We have local role models, we have national role models, we have international role models. We didn't have we didn't have female role models back in 1993. So we were really trying to plow that for ourselves. So there was a, a lot of work has been done by people my generation and a little bit older than me. Um, you know, the whole advent of, of social media with regard to a lot of our sports has given it a profile. Uh, you know, I think when, when Damien spoke about that, we need a combination of men and women involved. Absolutely, I, I agree with it. But I think when you're dealing with female athletes, like a female has an empathy to another female that perhaps a male doesn't have. You know, I would have even looked at the years that I was coaching. You know, you could coach a team of 30 girls, you know, and, and five of those, you might be able to devour the head of them if they didn't perform on any given day. But like 25 of them had a different style. You might have to talk to them privately. You know, two or three of them could be grouped together. So like, you know, th th there's an empathy that comes with being a female involved in sport as well. But I, I think the one overriding, you know, overriding reason why I got into football was that it was something that I was passionate about. Mm. And I just thought, you know, people can, 
you can have the worries of the world and the weight of the world on your shoulder. But the minute you step on a pitch, mm. the minute, as Mona said, she gets into the pool, mm. you just forget about everything. Like life is so busy for all of us. Mm. We need that little bit of time. So whatever can be done to try and encourage ladies, I would say, please get involved in this course by the sports partnership. I think it's 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 going to be monumental. And I wish everybody the very, very best to look at it. And, and I have another question then, Kathleen, again, because, you know, I'm very passionate about, I think officials, particularly referees, but I'm not in so many areas, but I'd like to know, like, what does actually leadership mean to you? We're here to learn tonight. I'm just wondering, what, what do you define a leader or what's your definition of being a leader? Well, I think, it, I think a leader is somebody who has a vision, um, but, but more importantly, can work with people to uh, bring that vision to to fruition you know it as i said it's important that you you surround yourself with like-minded people you know it's not all about going off on solar runs you know you have ideas that you discuss with people and you know you're not going to be right all the time you know something you might think that this is a wonderful idea and then you talk to a few of your friends in the sport about it and they say no kathleen i i don't think that's going to work but you have to be willing to take advice on board so like certainly for leadership, you must have a vision. There's no point, you know, if you're going to the captain of a ship, you have to know where you're going. You know, you can't go, go right, go left, go keep turning. You know, you have a vision, you know where you want to get to. And you try and encourage people to buy into that vision. And it's all about teamwork. Right, no, very interesting. Well, I could talk to you all night, Kathleen. I do have a question for you, but I'm gonna wait until we get back to the panel and I, I will ask it to you then because um I could be here, we could, we could spend so long talking to each panel, so we've just, time is against us tonight, so I will come back to you on my last question, Kathleen, um, when I go, get you back for the panel. And we're going to ask now, if that's all right, Trace, we're going to ask there to, uh, the um, poll question up, so I want you to get involved. I can't say enough to see more questions, guys. Um, so the question we want you to answer is, look, what we want to get actions out of tonight. It's not just, oh, it's nice to have a bit of a chat. We actually want some results and actions out of it. So, what can Sligo Sports Recreation um, Partnership do to increase the number of female leaders in sports in Sligo, right? Um, there's a multiple choice. You can pick your, your top and we come back to the answer. Like, is it more education? Do we need more of these leadership courses? Um, does media have a role? Do we, do we need to get more media coverage? Um, establishing a female sport network in the county, does that work? Uh, Sarah's going to talk about in a minute about some of the findings we found in the research but you know women who do stuff together it gets done and we have to support each other or do we need more female role models and ambassadors and sometimes we have the role models there but but do we shout about them enough do we give them enough you know it's about shining the spotlight on those role models and letting people tell their stories so I want you to all um put in a vote there and we'll have a look at the results later on okay um so have we ever got that? I want to see, just put your vote in there. Uh, so now, next up, we are, we're not too bad on time, but we're five minutes behind. Um, I'm going to call on Sarah O'Shea. Um, I'm very lucky to be uh, working with Sarah on this leadership project, with, uh, which she is going to go through with you. Sarah is hugely, has her own company, SOS Sports Consult. Um, she is a uh, hugely experienced in governance. Uh, we've done actually work together on some sports strategy, sailing and boxing, but she's done work with UEFA. She's very senior in the um, FAI um, until she set up her own company in 2015. And um, she's also the uh, voluntary secretary general of the Olympic Federation. Um, it's great. Uh, she and I work together because we've got different skill sets, but I couldn't do it on my own. So um, I'm going to hand over to her because she is going to go through some of the findings of the research that we did for the women's sports policy. So over to you, Sarah. Great, Lisa. Thanks very much. And delighted to be here with everybody in Sligo. Wish we could be in person, as Lisa said, and also really great working with Lisa. Uh, we do complement each other in terms of our, our different skill sets. So um, I'm really looking forward to discuss uh, the course we developed together. Um, and that we've rolled out. So I'll do that in a few minutes. But before um, we move on, I just want to talk a little bit about the context of why gender equality is still very important in sport and why there's still a little bit more work to do. So 
Um, you can see from this slide here, just a couple of stats. Now these fluctuate every now and then, but these are still kind of the overall stats in relation to how gender equality is positioned in overall society. So still very low figures there. You can see from corporate Ireland, 18% directors, still very low number of TDs and in the universities, only 20% professorships. And then we look at the national governing bodies, um, and I know Nora Stapleton will be on after me, so she may be able to advise whether these figures have fluctuated at all in the last 12 months. But you're looking at about 24% of women in CEO positions, 33% as board directors, and interestingly, in that director role, um, it's 44% uh, females are in the secretary position, as against the chair, 23%. So um, just good to see that. You can still see there's still a lot more work to do. So the next thing just to talk about is understanding perspectives. And if there's one takeaway I want everyone to take tonight is that gender equality is not a women's issue. It's really important. It's not a topic where uh, women should be setting up a women's group and it's only women discussing it. It is really, really, really important that men in clubs get on board with this and advocate for change. Really thrilled to hear Damien speaking earlier. Um, all the fantastic comments he made and he spoke particularly about diversity as well and that is really really important but tonight we're talking about gender equality and 50 percent of the population are women so it's really important clubs bring in diversity but don't forget all the hard work that still has to be done in relation to gender equality so it is about making women more visible in your clubs and coaching at all levels so um still plenty we, we can do at club level as well okay um, so um, Lisa mentioned there that herself and myself were involved in doing the research, which formed the basis for the, I suppose, the Sport Ireland strategy going forward, which Nora will speak to you about. And in that research that we did in Ireland, and we also benchmarked it internationally, these are the kind of barriers that are coming up in relation to um, women and maybe not putting themselves forward for leader, leadership positions. Big one that comes through is confidence. OK, it's a really big, big issue uh, that comes through. And even in the courses Lisa and I uh, do, comes through all of the time. And it's not that women don't have the skill set or they're not interested. It's sometimes they like to be asked and to be put forward and um, to be asked to go forward. They don't necessarily put themselves forward for roles. So really important if you're in a club to find women who are in your club who are interested in putting themselves forward. Tokenism is a big barrier. Nobody wants to be the only woman on the board or, or the committee, club committee, or on a club working group or whatever it is. Um, politics as well is a bit of a turnoff uh, for women. That came through very strong in international research and in Ireland that we did. And women particularly want to know what they're getting themselves into. You know, they like to know the detail of the role. They want to know what they're going to be asked to do. What's the time commitment? Because time commitment is a big thing as well in terms of um, anyone who's looking after kids or looking after elderly parents. And a lot of women are, are in those roles as well. Um, and I said before about the secretary role, women do often sometimes get asked to do the secretary role. Um, and it's a very important role. I'm an honorary secretary myself, so I know what's involved. Um, but it, it is also really important to involve women at all levels of the club. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Teresa. Great. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of kind of corporate research that's out there. And I know we're talking about clubs here. Um, however, this is mirrored and reflected in all areas of society. So I think some of you may have seen this kind of uh, statistic before. Um, and it's research that was done a number of years ago now, but it still stands. Um, and that is kind of, I suppose, the difference between men and women and how they perceive things. And the research out there shows that women only apply for jobs if they feel they meet 100% of the criteria, whereas men will tend to give it a go and put themselves forward if they meet just 60%. And I think that's a really important statistic. And just to, to take that away and have a think about it, that sometimes women feel they have to be absolutely a perfect fit for a role, and that's why they don't put themselves forward for positions. Um, and that includes sporting positions as well, because that came through in the research we did with the Sport Ireland uh, consultation. And then as well, that applies to promotions. And you can move on to the next slide there, Teresa. Again, the research for promotions in the workplace, again, um, shows that. And as well for board positions. So in corporate Ireland at board positions, 42% of, of women, uh, of anybody who's approached to go on a board um, are approached by an existing board member. Now that's really, really important because it means if you have a club committee 
or at NGV level, it's a board. And if it's predominantly male, uh, the tendency, the unconscious tendency would be to go and approach um, others within your own network. So if a committee is predominantly uh, made up of, of men, then there is an uh, unconscious decision sometimes to go and ask somebody from within your network, which might more favor um, male candidates, okay? So you can move on there to the next slide. Okay, so what can you do as a club? What can we all do as clubs? Um, first of all, I suppose really important is to discuss the issue, to table it, have a look at your club and see, um, do you have enough women involved in your club at all levels? And are they in leadership positions? Are they on your committee? Are, are they chairing? Do they have access to that? And try and agree an overall strategy for the club about bringing that gender balance back in. And if necessary, set up a working group, but it shouldn't be a working group all of women. It should be 50-50 where possible uh, to start um, thinking it through and what the club can do. Have a look at your structures as well and your club constitution. See how you can encourage more coaching, more volunteers, and see maybe your election process is putting women off as well going forward if you're struggling with getting women involved at the committee level. Uh, take a look at your policies and then um, maybe nominate somebody to do this fantastic leadership course that Sligo, our um, Sport and Recreation Partnership are backing. Um, and that will be rolling out over the next few weeks. So it's something for you to consider. So regarding the course then itself, um, myself and Lisa, as Lisa explained, developed this course together. And we have now, uh, it's actually over 150 women we've done now as of today. And they're aged between 19 and 68. We usually have 16 on each course. And they've come from like over 30 different organizations, all different levels, women who are volunteers, who are athletes, who are coaches, who are already on committees, or women who are interested in getting involved in committees as well. Um, women who are, you know, helping out in the club, their parents, but they might be interested in helping out the working group or helping out at club committee level. So all levels of women are welcome to be considered for this course, okay? And the course topics that are included are there on the screen. You know, we talk about values, leadership, the importance of networking, collaboration, how to deal with challenging situations, challenging people, which we all have to deal with, resilience, conflict, crisis management, communications, influence and change. And very importantly as well, we do, we do a piece on governance. Very hands-on course, it's very interactive. It's online every evening uh, for an hour and a half. And uh, we do breakout sessions. So uh, really important for um, to nominate women in, the, in your club and you feel might be interested in this course. And if it goes well, maybe um, we'll talk to the partnership about whether uh, they want another one run in the new year or something like that. So if you want to go on to the next slide there, give you the details. Okay, so it's on Thursday evenings, starting on Thursday 4th, running all the way through to Thursday 16th of December. And it's from 7 to 8.30 in the evening. So it should suit volunteers, hopefully. Um, and as I said, it's a very interactive course. So it's not webinar style like tonight. It's cameras on, getting involved, doing exercises with Lisa and I. And we both have between us like 30 years of administration in sport at that senior level. So I suppose we've, we've seen it all, done it all. Um, we think anyway, and um, nothing phases us. So uh, we've lots of, uh, lots of time to give back to everybody. Okay, and then the last slide there, I think, is how you're going to apply the course application. So the deadline is uh, today week, which is the 20th of October, and it's open for uh, women who are involved in your club over the age of 18. And um, you must be based in Sligo. You must be obviously involved in the club at some level and that you're e eager to contribute as well. Um, while it's not essential, uh, it is good to get an endorsement from your club if possible. And the applications are on, available through the website through Eventbrite, so you can go onto the Sligo Sport and Recreation.ie website and you'll find the link there. And Shuan, who's on the call tonight as well, you can email Shuan uh, for any more information and that's her email address there. So that's it from me. I'm delighted, uh, hard to follow Mona there and Kathleen, but delighted to be here meeting everybody. And um, I'll hand over back to Lisa now. So thank you very much. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. And you forgot one thing, Sarah, that it's a bit of fun as well. It's fun. We have yeah. fun and laughter. It's not all like... It won't be that serious. <laughs> you know, and we celebrate the last night. So, and we might even get together in person after that. But it is genuinely, uh, we both really enjoy it. Um, we feel energized after it. So, uh, yeah, so sign up now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on that course. Um, the course when we started off, Sarah and I actually plotted it up in Donegal um, 
over a few weeks and uh, then the pandemic struck and um, we uh, had to move it all online as we said we'd try it and, and we did and, and was hugely successful and we've had great feedback out of it and then Sport Ireland um, came in and evaluated it and they're very much um, supportive of us which we're delighted which brings me on to our next guest Nora Stapleton. Um, Nora is the uh, Women in Sport Lead for Sport Ireland, uh, former international rugby player. She's played GAA and soccer and doing her mother duties earlier this evening there. She was hoping she gets the child to bed out. And this is what we're like as women trying to balance everything. But um, when, when Sarah and I did the research that went on to do the policy, we absolutely were so strong with sort of you need to put somebody of the right caliber in as that women in sport lead if we were to make any progress this is back around 18 or around like that and look we're, we're thrilled now because we've just seen her blossom and bloom over the last number of years and really make an impact so um thrilled um that you could make some time to be with us tonight nora and all i want to say to you is actually could we just hear about uh, what are some, what's going on at a national level? What are you in Sport Ireland since, you, since your role um, has started? What are the areas that we have made some impact in and, and how could, could you suggest LIGO could really um, inspire and, and bring more leaders to the fore? Over to you. God, okay, thank you. Um, thanks so much, Lisa and, and Sarah. And it's great to see everybody from Sligo LSP as well. Um, I, I know a number of people got up there, I guess. Um, Yes, so I came into the role in 2019, April 2019. So that was when, after all your hard work and your research, um, Sport Ireland then developed their policy for women in sport. Uh, so we have four main areas where leadership and governance is one of the key areas that, that we've been looking at for the last two years and a bit now, I guess. Um, to quickly mention other areas, uh, we focus a lot on coaching and officiating, um, active participation, and then visibility would be the fourth space as well. So. Um, it keeps me busy. There's plenty happening, but look, there, there's so much more to do. But I mean, there's a lot of, like everybody in Sport Ireland has a remit for women in sport. It's no longer because I'm in the role or one person has the title of it, that that person is the only staff member who's doing any work for women in sport. So that that's definitely not the case. And it's not the case in a lot of the local sports or, well, the local sports partnerships, but then GBs as well, or the national governing bodies. Um, now we know that sport is for everybody um coaching is for everyone officiating is for everybody and the dial has shifted you know and if you're not on board you're going to get left well behind um, and that's certainly what we're seeing so we talked to the or as sarah mentioned some of the stats from the leadership or the governance side of things i guess we've just completed our recent snapshot which would be our third snapshot of the board composition figures um, it's maybe a little bit slightly different. We go off a lot of our core grant applications that come back in. But what we're looking at now is that the number of women on boards has increased from 29% to 31% as since November of last year. It mightn't sound like much, but that has increased from 24% back in uh, 2018 or whenever you looked at it first. So it definitely has moved. How are we moving it? You know, the, as I said, the NGBs have to get on board. Um, we've developed a resource, uh, Gender Diversity and Boards resource, which is a really useful tool for people, board members especially, chairpersons, CEOs, LSP coordinators, that they can refer to and then look at, okay, we know we want more women on the board, so how is it that we're going to do this? So the framework kind of offers uh, some suggested examples of what you might do in order to encourage and promote more women into leadership roles on the board. And we run webinars, et cetera, on that as well, so that we continuously to upskill and educate the sector. We know that the likes of leadership courses are so important. As you mentioned, we as Sport Ireland, our evaluation unit evaluated the course that yourself and Sarah run. And the reason for doing that was, you know, I'm convinced and I was convinced anyway that it was a really good program, but I wanted to ensure that we were able to tell others that the topics that you're covering um, that they work, that females find the benefit in them, but not just that female leaders see themselves progress and grow as a leader having come through the programme, but they're then, they then end up in roles within their clubs and within their sports uh, where they're making decisions for the whole sport. And I think that's what's absolutely vital, isn't it? As we've spoken about, 
females make up 50% of the population. So our boards and committees should completely reflect that. And if you're looking around your club and you realize that it's not, then it's time to roll up your sleeves and do something. And um, so we evaluated this course, all the facts and figures came true. Um, females came away from it feeling more confident, feeling like they would put their hand up for positions, um, feeling like they could challenge people when they felt that somebody was making the wrong decision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it ticked all the boxes and we're delighted that the likes of Sligo um, are running this particular course as well. Um, there are other leadership courses that some of the other local sports partnerships are delivering. Donegal have one starting off soon as well. Um, and I guess for ourselves in Sport Ireland, we are there to support with funding. Um, and if we see value in certain topics, then that's what we want to lend funding to, or that's what we want to provide it for. So as I said, these types of leadership courses are happening around the country and it's just fantastic. Um, the sports as well, we have our Women in Sport funding programme that we give to the national governing bodies. And again, you know, as you said, I think there's what 30 plus organisations. A lot of those organisations use the Sport Ireland funding in order to put females through the course. And we're delighted to be able to do that because we know then that the outcome will be more women who are helping the decision making in sport. So that's kind of a lot on the leadership and governance. We do, you know, in the coaching space, we've recently launched our coaching toolkit. Um, a big part of that, you'll see the national governing bodies linking with their clubs, hopefully to bring through some of the ideas and the concepts that are within that toolkit. So it's all about how do we recruit more female coaches? How do we develop them? How do we retain them in coaching? Um, and then of course, as I think it was Mona who said, you know, her female coach was such a role model for her. We know that female coaches can help keep girls in sport and keeping teenage girls in sport is a huge, huge, um, a, a huge topic and concept that we're all trying to solve. Um, but we know that female coaches help that. And then we know that female coaches are more likely to encourage other females to start coaching. So it's just a, you know, a, a snowball effect once we start seeing female in these kinds of leadership roles. So yeah, hopefully that's helped. I haven't gone into mentoring courses or other leadership courses, but there's so much in this space that we, we don't have time to talk about it all. No, but yeah. you bring in the whole panel. Um, Nor, just on yourself, what's the one leadership lesson you could give to anybody watching this that you've had from a personal experience on interest? Oh, I, look, I have so many. I mean, you have to learn as you go through life. You, um, from being on sports teams, I've learned that when you don't speak up, you regret it. Um, so I, I've done that, and you never regret not speaking up, and you never regret challenging, because at least in four, five, ten years time, when you look back, you know that you did your best to challenge a situation that you knew was wrong and was found out to be wrong. So I think for me, it's certainly as like, sometimes you, you don't think of yourself as a leader, but that's all comes with everybody is a leader and you just have to, I think it was Cassie mentioned, you have to just be brave and decide that you're going to call somebody out or you're going to question or challenge something. Um, and that can make all the difference. So certainly uh, as a player, that would be one. And then my other biggest thing as a leader is that you respect people. You know, you respect, you respect anybody who is working in an organization with you, whether I don't like the whole term of, you know, being on different levels of management or anything like that, because it shouldn't matter. You respect up and you respect down if that's how you look at it, because everybody contributes. And the minute somebody stops, then it just, again, it's a snowball effect. So I think respect goes an awful long way. Great. Thank you very much. Key message and key values for us all. Um, I'm going to call the whole panel back, but before I do, Therese, can we just have the results of the poll? I think we were too quick for some people, um, but we'd just be interested to see. So I think, so the winner there definitely is about a uh, female sport network, which really interested in 54%, and leadership courses following at 41%. And I suppose one leaves out of the other. Um, I think through all the research we've done, if we have the support of other females, we actually achieve more. So that's something Deirdre, um, which if we get kind of the panelists now all together, I might uh, I might ask you just to, to pipe, just to comment on that about uh, a female network. Um, I bring all the panelists back if we can together. Yeah. And you're on mute there. That's the, 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 the word of the pandemic, you're on mute. 
Okay, thank you, Lisa. And just to acknowledge everybody who contributed. It's been very inspirational listening to everybody. And um, yeah, I suppose this is, you know, the, the whole purpose here is for us to get some signposting in terms of how we can take things forward. And uh, certainly, uh, I, I understand the leadership course as a, as a starting point. It will be a platform for uh, maybe a network to evolve from it. And, you know, I suppose once that hopefully happens, then it could transpire and it broaden out into a, into a, a bigger group. So, yeah, I think as a, as, a, as, a, as a partnership, we're committed now and we're very focused on the, uh, you know, having continued the participation side, but now I'm actually uh, focusing on the leadership side as well. And uh, I think the whole thing of communication and asking people, just like we did here tonight uh, in terms of how, the, how we would facilitate that network will be uh, something we take on board and, and we, we hopefully drive on with, with uh, yeah. It's drive on that's the key word but i want to bring um some uh not that i'm i'm just talking on behalf of myself some youth into the discussion now uh we've got Maeve McHugh who's come with us and joined us on the panel and Maeve is 19 and she's in ul and i when i had a chat with her before i said wow she actually came on transition year into work experience into sligo um so to work with the team and from that then that gave her the love she played sports but she got so many coaching qualifications and now she's in UL and achieved really so much in this whole space uh, at 19 but maybe, maybe I'll ask you you've heard what everybody's had to say uh, tonight us of all different decades and ages and I, I'm just wondering for any teenager that's out there uh, you you're well on your leadership journey any any recommendations you would give to them to encourage them to start sooner rather than later um, basically, I don't know if you can hear me that well because mm -hmm. I'm actually still in the arena um, in UL, but uh, to be honest, if I was actually talking to girls like face to face right now, at the age of like, say, sixth class going into first year, straight away, the first thing I'd say to them was keep going with sport. I could name maybe like, I, I sure three or four of my friends still play sport. And that's out of a lot of friends. like seems to like just fall off the face of the earth with once they go into first year it's just it just stops because I do see like girls do get a lot more anxious they are a lot more self-conscious which I even worked with the girls active last year and I just thought that was great because you see the girls coming out of the shell you'd see the girls walking around and like playing uh, P or doing P with the lads and shit. the girls would just sit out and I'm not shaming girls or anything but like the girls would just sit out but when it came to girls actors, the girls got stuck in themselves, which was actually great to see. I just think girls need to just be not in, like slightly encouraged more to actually continue their sport. It doesn't matter what sport it is, but definitely be encouraged more. And if there's more girls coaches, I think there's plenty of girls coaches, but I think if there's more girls coaches as well, I think it's just great because I know my the coaches in Dynamo, they are all girls. And I just thought it was great because I was like, okay, no, this is who I want to be when I'm older. It kind of does give you a role model to look mm -hmm. towards. Mm -hmm. And it does like push you on yourself. You're like, no, I want to do this. I want to be a coach. I want to continue my journey. And I just think sports should just be pushed a little bit more. With girls, the girls active was great. And I know you were talking about uh, girls soccer as well. And I just think that's great. Like it just needs to be pushed a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I just think girls just need to work away and do it themselves. And, and do you do you see yourself as a leader, Maeve? Uh, <laughs> I suppose I am, like, I'd see myself like I am head coach of the Gymnastics Academy in UL. So I would see myself as probably a leader in that sense. And then as well at home, like, even to my own friends and stuff, I would kind of be encouraging, like, oh, why don't we go and join this sport? Why don't we do this sport? I do kind of pull people along because I enjoy it myself. I just know how good it is. She, as Mona said, it got her through her junior cert and leaving cert and she was the exact same with me. I didn't know what to do with myself when the pandemic hit and I couldn't do gymnastics anymore. I really didn't. Mm. And I just, it's just been a huge part of my life. And I think it has so much more benefits to it than any negatives at all. And I just think girls should really be encouraged to take more up and even take up a little bit more coaching and I know girls sometimes can sit back and be like, I'll wait until someone asks me, do I want to become a coach? Mm -hmm. I think it should be more like, oh, let's let's try and be my coach myself. Like, just let's try and 
get it go get the ball rolling myself personally so yeah and I think we will have to watch this we'll keep an eye on her now where she ends up now <laughs> in some organization see how with Sport Ireland or, or something like that uh well done Maeve um we've got a few questions in so anybody on the panel can answer there's one here um how do women, anybody can, as a few of you could answer this, uh, how do women push through a male dominated draconian organization where politics is to the forefront? Anybody want to take that one? I'll have a go. Go on, Sarah. <laughs> With my governance hat on. Uh, look, it, it's not easy. Um, what I would say is um, I'm a great believer in buy in. So it's really about sitting with the people that you've labeled as draconian and trying to explain to them how important it is for the club and the legacy it brings that the club is, is a members club and you know everyone is passing through. So it's really important to bring that diversity and try and um, encourage those individuals, the dr draconian individuals, the positives of bringing in that diversity and effectively how it can make them look good to bring in diversity as well, that, that can help um whether it's manipulation or, or trying to get them to do what you want to do but that's probably the first piece of advice and uh, it mightn't always work but i think that's where it starts I, I can jump in as well like i always think it's worth pointing out what your neighbors are doing so you point you know whoever that local club or whoever your club's rivals are what are they doing are you can be sure that you'll find a club down the road who are embracing their community they're embracing diversity equality inclusion and they're seeing the effects of it because I think when you involve women, women's values are different to men's and they want to create that community environment within clubs as well. And I think when they do that, it brings in more members um, and it just kind of, I suppose, challenges the unconscious bias that exists within it. Um, and then the final point I would make, and I, only because I've come from a club where I've had to deal with all this myself, but most of the men tend to be in business, and um, at least some of them will be anyway. And there's so much research in business that points towards better gender balance on boards. And so it's quite handy to be able to pull the stats and the figures from the business world where better balance means better business. Um, and sometimes they listen to that as well. There's a question, Kathleen, I might ask you, and it's not too far away from what Nora said. Um, just in terms of uh, can we learn from any they actually ask not about business but they ask for any the women's representation issues research found in the whole stem area which is quite different um around confidence confidence or tokenism is there anything else that can be used from other areas maybe to help us in this field oh gosh you have you have caught me now on that one <laughs> um let me see or even in education i mean i i just because i suppose you come from your p background there you know i think even the education world we've seen a change in the last six months in terms of female leaders in that whole sphere um we, we have I, I i i don't understand stem i, I you've just lost me there i think that. i think it's, it's a question here but can we learn from any of the women representation issues research around found in the same area was the question that came in so i suppose they used to be very the science technology area i think it was when we studied at school it was all for boys and it wasn't really for women but now it's being kind of uh, marketed kind of to, to more open uh, open it up it's not just oh Oh, you're the girls do home economics and the boys do science and kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I, mean? I think you know. I think, I think, think, I think again, it's about it's about finding role models. You know, yeah, okay. you know, every every girl, every woman needs to know that they're not the first person to do this. You yeah, know that right. if if they have somebody that they can aim towards and say that yes, it can be done, and if that person can reach it, well then I can. Um, yeah. yeah. Because look, it's not if the change isn't going to happen overnight. But it is certainly moving in the right direction yeah. no doubt about it yeah so role models i think that's key you can't see what you can't be or you can't be what you can't see that was yeah. a, got a right story around that's it. It, totally and um there is a there is a query there and i'd be interested dear to what you think about it because a couple of people said it in the stats that we did and maybe some shoe and sorry my, we might come back to it you know, if you took the big three out would it have been any difference in the results or is it is it just as a, which we, you know, might be so interesting to look to dig down that data and see if that skews the results. Um, obviously, this is we've got a lot of smaller um, <clears throat> sports there that maybe they feel they're they're better than that. So it'll be it will be interesting to look at that. And um, there's a question here about look, 
I wouldn't, and this is a, this is something we come across a lot. I wouldn't have the confidence just to sign, to join a women's sporting network. And they're wondering if people's women are already in roles or part of a network. Or what would you say to that person? Uh, Lisa, I might just comment on that. And we were even talking about that in, your office, in the office um, over the last few weeks. And I suppose it's it, it, that notion of readiness, you know, people, women's readiness are to actually join the network and, and feel, it, you know, when, when is the time right? And one of the observations we have made as a staff is so many of the women that we have observed who took part in women in sport participation programs actually grew in confidence and have now gone on to become leaders. Be it, be it examples of canoeing projects, the women's try a try, biking, going on to positions in cycling clubs, uh, sailing. So I suppose the, you know it, it's acknowledging and I think it's a very valuable point that you know we, it's a slow process and there's you know it, we have to start at the very foundation. And I think Damien even remarked on you know having a broad base. And you know, the broad base starts at having women participating in sports in the first place and then them progressing and growing in confidence. So I think it's a very uh, noteworthy um, observation and I, I think it's one we'll be mindful of, uh, you know, so that it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of a stepping stones project to, to actually get even as far as the network. And, and I suppose Sligo as a county, you've got so much natural resources, you know, uh, the sea, the, the whole area. I mean, there's so much natural resources the county you have to offer being active and being part of the sport. Uh, I'm conscious of time because we are, are coming to an end, but there's another, just uh, literally one or two last ones. Um, do you think the success of a woman's club is, is dependent on the success of men's club historically uh, before them? And success could be then dependent on actual funding that's there? Is it necessarily, is that necessarily the case? Have you found? I'll jump in. Um, I think the, the issue with that question is that we're calling it women's club and men's club. Yeah. Mm. And now maybe that's because it's coming from a GEA place where I know, you know, you have the GEA and then LGFA and the Camogie. And, and in some cases it can be three separate clubs in one building for want of a, of a better description. Um, but then we have, you know, the, the GA or, you know, the one club model is working in a lot of places. They're finding huge success at it. And a lot of people feel that when they go to the GA club, they're there to play GEA and they don't see themselves as being in the men's side or the women's side. So I think that's something to bear in mind. And then when it comes to funding, if it's an equal club, this is where, you know, where do decisions get made? Who decides on the budget for each team? and who's on that panel or that committee that makes those decisions. And that's why if you're truly going to be equal, then you need to be unbiased at those meetings and treat funding in the way it should be. Um, so that's probably something that maybe I'd point out around that one. Um, but can I divert back to another question as well, Lisa, you asked about the big three. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody said, you know, are they in the numbers 38 national governing bodies have 30 percent or more women on their boards 29 are yet to reach 30 percent so the big three don't skew the numbers there's so many who are under that 30 percent under 20 percent and under 10 percent um but all those stats will come out uh, so yeah the big three certainly have more to do but they're not the only ones okay um, I, I I have to have it. I always have a soft spot for students. We have to we have to get this question in for a transition year student. Um, I'm worried that if I pick up sport now, I'll be way behind because they're only picking it up when they're about 15 or 16. Um, do you have, do you have any advice in starting this late? And how do I balance my sport and social life as a student? I know that's more in participation, but uh, we have to answer any anything. Actually, maybe Maeve there yeah. could answer that one before we have to finish up. We're running way over. <laughs> um, it doesn't matter what, I, I don't think it matters what time, like when you pick up a sport, if you enjoy it, that's like, you don't have to be good at the sport. You just have to enjoy doing it. And that will add to the social aspect. I know I had a great social life and I, balance my sport and I got into college and I'm still doing the same here like I don't think it's about like is it too late to pick up sport it's never too late to pick up sport if you enjoy doing it it's it's benefiting you completely you don't have to be good at it you don't have to be competitive about it you can just pick up something just for the social aspect just to get out of the house 
just to start something new even start as a coach i know people that have started just as coaches and haven't done the actual sport as a child but just love the sport so i've been like i'm not going to pick it up but i may like become a coach in it and i just think that's great so i actually don't think there's ever a time that's too late to like pick up a sport ever yeah. and i messaged that 15 year 16 year old when you hit 50 you can still take up sports take it from me uh, personal experience um, I, I really have to, we hear it comes in, it's 20 past eight, you've gone very over, but there, there's one thing I do, would like to leave, like there's a number of people watching in here tonight, and I'd like everybody, instead of us all talking here, it should be great if you all made one commitment that you would get one person or put somebody for the course or encourage somebody to take up a leader position. If everybody here, even the 100 people that were here tonight, got one person over the line, you know, it wouldn't be great if we'd have 100 leaders that we didn't have before, um, which would be fantastic. I'm going to say um, thank you to the panel. I am going to hand over. It's great we have a female chair um, in Sligo. And hopefully I have Emer Cannon there to wrap us up. Is she here? She is. Great. Yes. Um, um, delighted now. Uh, the leadership is, is good and strong and, and you're leading. You're walking the talk by the female leaders in uh, Sligo. So Emer, I might just leave it to you to... Yeah, you're the passion sportswoman yourself and working for um, in the, the council and that. And I know you're, you're a very strong advocate of all of this. And leadership in this area comes from the top. And if you've got the chair uh, of the, the board uh, on this road, we know it's going to be a success. So I'm just going to hand over to you to um, give some closing remarks before we finish up. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, I just want to say that I, I thought tonight was absolutely inspirational. Um, and I really think that uh, tonight's webinar and with the new Women in Sport Leadership course that is being rolled out, I think they're just really fantastic examples of the pioneering initiative initiatives that the Sligo Sports, Sports Partnership are involved in. I think tonight we have heard really, really valuable insights from, from inspirational leaders um, in the area of sport and life, basically. And I just really, really want to thank all of the contributors for tonight for giving so generously of your time and sharing your own experiences of women in leadership roles in sport. And I think, you know, the real life stories is what really, you know, resonates with people. You know, I think that's so, so important. It's real. It's, 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 it's not textbook. So I, I want, I'd like to thank Lisa for, for our fantastic MC tonight. I think you made everybody feel really comfortable and I think it was a really enjoyable experience. Um, all the contributors, Siobhan, Damien, Kathleen, Sarah, Nora, Maeve, our own local Olympian Mona, all the way from the US. And I, I think everybody brought different perspectives to the discussion. And that's really what made it interesting. All the, diff, all the diverse, you know, perspectives and ideas, you know, I, I think was absolutely fantastic. And it just shows you the wealth of talent and really everybody is a leader. Everybody here tonight is a leader, which is just absolutely fantastic. And as I said earlier, it's, it's absolutely inspirational. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank Deirdre. Uh, and her team of Diane and Teresa tonight for making it happen. Uh, it would never happen without Deirdre and her team. So thanks a million guys. And I'd like to thank all the participants, everybody who took the time to log on um, every, and, and contribute as you did. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the fruits of all of this. Um, really, we want to see a gradual increase in, in women as leaders in sport as a result, as a result of, this, of these initiatives. And I think I'm, I'm really encouraged by it. And I really think that tonight has been a fantastic kickstart of it all. And I really, really hope that participants are encouraged to participate in the course. And even just, even if you don't have the opportunity to participate in the course, just look at your own situation in your own club and look at maybe having, having the confidence to step up and become a leader. So thanks, thanks very much again to everybody tonight and look forward, as I said, to seeing the results of it all. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, uh, everybody. Uh, sign up now. You've got the details there. It was a privilege to be here tonight. Uh, privilege to be talking to the people of Sligo. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, I did laugh. There's a few comments here that listening to me have made people smile. And I think listening to everybody here made a smile tonight. So um, keep the women in sport leadership flag flying. We're very passionate about it. And we hope to see you in person, Sligo, very soon. Ihoa. Thanks, everyone.